I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Conference Committee to order. Today is May 11th, 2021. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Right, Chair Hansen is present. Uh, Representative Wozlowick. Wozlowick present. Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Representative Heinzeman. Heinzeman present. Uh, Chair Ingebretson. Chair Ingebretson is present and we do have a quorum and that's all, that's really all we need. Thank you. Um, Senator Rood. Rood present. Uh, Senator Eichhorn. Eichhorn present. Uh, Senator Tomasoni. Senator Tomasoni. Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom. And uh, as Chair Ingebretson said, a quorum is present. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, so today, uh, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, not much has changed. We have, uh, uh, we do not support a two-year delay in the clean car rulemaking. And since the offer was contingent upon uh, that, uh, I think it's important that we have some members with questions about uh, some items uh, in the bill and uh, um, so we'd like to proceed with some of those questions uh, today. I don't think we'll be lasting all morning. I know uh, members have some other uh, items to, to deal with. Um, it appears that as we're moving towards May 17th, uh, uh, that not much is happening anywhere, uh, not just in this committee, uh, but we will proceed with trying to uh, deal with information and see if we can uh, reach some uh, compromise. So I know uh, Representative Wozlawick had a question about uh, some differences in our items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was actually, I know um, we had a little bit of uh, conversation about this um, in our committee, but I'm wondering if um, uh, someone from the DNR could just talk a little bit about the turtle um, provisions in the omnibus bills. Um, I, I think I'd like to hear a little bit of background information about sort of how we got here um, to this point, because I think this is an issue that's been um, worked on for a couple of years. So if there's someone from DNR who can talk a little bit about that history and how we got to this point and, and, and what we're doing with uh, turtle stuff in the bill. And maybe as DNR is getting ready, I know Senator Ingebrigtsen, and I think you raised your hand. I, uh, is it still up? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yeah. You got me. Okay. All right. Uh, well, you know, we've, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we haven't got anywhere. I mean, we, uh, we certainly haven't got anywhere with any proposals, but we've certainly had a good discussion. Uh, we're very familiar with the DNR uh, discussion. So I think what we're going to do is, uh, being I did not get a, a, a decent proposal here. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, little, uh, little concerned that we're getting closer and closer here. Uh, I don't know what part the administration is playing in, in helping you out with this. Um, but Representative Hanson, you, uh, yesterday you spoke about policy based on the offers we have received. It's apparent that your officers have not been serious and serious considering policy issues you claim that are priorities. Have you that you and which you've not not yet even included in your proposals? I mean, we talked about environmental justice. We talked about several different things yesterday, and and I've seen nothing like that in your proposals. So, uh, so with that, I look forward to see, seeing a serious offer from the House addressing those very issues and demonstrating good faith negotiations. And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I see no reason to sit around and. and Discuss, but if you uh, are with the DNR and, and your members aren't familiar with the bill, you can, you know, certainly go ahead and do that. Uh, but at, at this point in time, uh, I will be leaving the meeting, and my uh, my conferees uh, can weigh in on this if they'd like, or they can also stay, whatever they choose to do. But until I get an offer, that's where I'm going to be at. Okay. Well, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, you know, we've already provided two offers in a row. Um, I don't think it's the House's responsibility to keep changing their offers based on your acceptance or whether you think they're serious or not. 
we provided a serious offer. Every offer we've done has been serious. And we have been trying to uh, achieve at least some common ground on some items. Uh, but when it continues to be that the LCCMR should be used for in the budget and that a two-year delay of clean cars, that everything is contingent on that, it's very difficult to do anything. And so uh, we believe there are priorities. We included one uh, yesterday, which was the AIS fee. Uh, that was uh, there. Um, you know, a normal process would be, we've, we've provided three offers. I believe you've provided two. Um, it would be your turn to respond, but I'm open to trying to find some other, you know, if, if that doesn't work, uh, we have some items today we wanna talk about that are differences in the bill. Uh, and I would uh, ask you to stay or one of your members or two of your members to stay because I think we can help problem solve by sharing information on that. Uh, there's some provisions you have uh, and some provisions we have and some provisions where they're different. So, uh, um, but I understand if you've, if you've got other things to do, uh, uh, that's uh, until we're still dealing with the clean car thing, um, you know, it's hard to move past that. I again would, if we're moving towards May 17th and uh, things are not getting done, I would ask, Again, if you can consider moving the LCCMRs as part of this conference committee, maybe that's all we can agree on. I think uh, we're probably very close on the 2021 and we're kind of close on the 2020. It would be a shame to dance up to, 20, to June 30th and uh, find that those don't occur. Mr. Chair. Senator Pinkerbrinson. Sure, I, the offer I got the last offer I got from you was was basically, uh, with all due respect, uh, quite meaningless. So <clears throat> the second offer that I got was uh, quite significant. Um, if you're not if you're not willing to move on any of those articles or those things that we were talking about, I I don't I don't see uh, sitting here and and uh, just talking today is going to do any good. Actually, you, I would suggest that uh, maybe the DNR spend some time with you. Uh, uh, and, and go over the bills if you're not familiar with the bills. LCCMR, now you know very well that that's staying in the bill. Uh, and you're holding strong on the uh, clean cars. And, and uh, um, that's real, you know, that's kind of where we're at. But I have, you know, we can get a lot of other stuff done, but I don't, I don't get anything hardly, any, any proposals of any substance. But, so I'll, I will be waiting. And uh, um, I will let you know whether or not well, we're going to call the meeting tomorrow. So. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, I do have one uh, kind of completely different thing, if you're interested. Sure, uh, if you're, of course. So I think that the timber relief, uh, there, those contracts for mm -hmm. uh, those loggers up north uh, has a deadline. Uh, and now we have got federal guidance, um, you know, from from the feds on what they can spend money on. and. We would like to prepare, I've been working with Representative Eklund, we would like to prepare a letter to the governor asking, because I, I think there's a, an extreme timeliness of trying to provide relief to those loggers. And I would ask you if you are willing to, you know, this isn't passing legislation, but if we could jointly do a letter <clears throat> to, the, to the governor on timber relief, uh, you know, that would take it out of our budget hands. But I think it's, uh, clearly legitimate for the the federal money, and it would be timely for those loggers up north. So I, I would ask you if you are if you'd like to consider working on that uh, today, because I think timeliness uh, for those folks up in the logging industry is is somewhat uh, uh, needed. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. I think there's a timely issue there, and I would like to work with you on that if if you are willing. Yes, I am willing to do that. I'd like to see it in written form, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, we'll decide then. Uh, and go ahead and uh, go ahead and uh, send it over to me when you're done. Uh, but you're right. However, it is a very large uh, financial issue in the bill, and as you know, we're not going to talk about that until I get my targets. Now we've got uh, all kinds of indication from the federal government that uh, um, we are all going to be receiving money to disperse uh, yesterday. Uh, but still has not, it has not trickled down to the targets. So as far as making any decisions, no. 
Um, but requesting from the governor, I'd be more than happy to look at that. Okay. All right. Um, we'll go back to uh, Representative Wozlawick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see um, Assistant Commissioner Meyer has popped up. If he can just talk a little bit about how we got here and then um, if it makes more sense for our, um, our research staff to go through the differences between the turtle provisions and the House bill and the Senate bill, I think that would be helpful too. Maybe um, if Ms. Taylor could just walk through those sections and then um, Commissioner Meyer could respond. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Chair and members, there are a number of uh, different turtle provisions. Uh, the first one is on R51. There's a house only section 78 that removes the um, turtle seller's license. Or wait, no, I'm, I'm sorry. There's one before that. And I just wanna thank Ms. Taylor for all of her work while she's uh, patiently going through the, uh, the side-by-sides. Yeah. And Mr. No, Stanley, so Ms. Taylor. No, I'm gonna skip that one for now so you don't have to wait for me. Um, but this particular one that I was mentioning is, um, this is the one that would prohibit the sale of um, turtles and also require a recreational turtle license. And then there is a Senate only section um, on the bottom of that page, section 78. I don't know if Mr. Stanley is still here, or if he left with the Senate, but um, this particular one um, would um, remove the uh, prohibition on transferring only once the turtle seller's license. Mr. Then, Stanley? Proceed, Ms. Taylor. Okay. Uh, section 79 and on R52, um, this section would make some conforming changes to the removal of the turtle seller's license, and then also sort of expand some of the exemptions from the turtle seller's license, for example, um, adding aquatic farm licensees. Uh, section 79 and 80 on the bottom of R52, the, uh, the Senate is um, taking, I think this was a DNR proposal to um, add to the list of things you can't do in order to take turtles. And the Senate is taking their um, provision as it was introduced, the adding firearms and ammunition, bow and arrow, um, spears and harpoons. The House has the spears and harpoons and then also make some changes related to the removal of the turtle seller's licenses. And then on R53, section 80 and 81, um, these are mostly um, the same. These are um, putting limits on the, um, the number of turtles you can possess based on different species. Uh, the only difference is, is the house has some language getting stricken because of the removal of the turtle seller's license. And then I think there's some repealers that are related to the house provision. And then there's also, um, a prohibition on any additional transfers later on in the bill. I don't know if you want me to find that. And then there's one other section where the turtle seller's license fee and the apprentice fee is um, removed as well. And I can look through that. But if you guys want to discuss with the DNR as I kind of look through, find those page numbers. And, you know, maybe Senator Rood, I think it went through their policy committee over there. Maybe uh, she could uh, help out. Uh, Senator Rood there. Senator Rood. Senator Rood. Doesn't appear she's there. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you for the record. Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And thank you for letting me uh, talk a little bit about this important issue as we've talked about in committee. Um, Ms. Taylor talked about the differences in the bill. 
The major one of concern is the Senate position that would remove the sunset provision on turtle licenses, allowing them to be transferred to continue. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, I have a few slides I would like to show if possible. Would that be okay? That would be awesome. I think anything we can do to help uh, enlighten the conversation uh, so we're familiar with the terms and I think it's important for Minnesotans to see what we're talking about. Is that okay, Representative Wetzlawick? Uh, it helps answer questions. So, Commissioner Meyer. Now I just have to figure out how to do it. So give me a second here. Um, I think you should be able to see my screen now. I just want to talk a little bit about some, some dynamics in, in the population dynamics. As we know, turtles are long lived. They have a very delayed sexual maturity, 10 plus years for many species. High nest predation, um, as you can see, raccoons, foxes, things like that, other birds. Uh, low hatchling and juvenile survival rates. High annual survivorship of adults due to few natural enemies. And adult uh, turtles are most important age class for power, the most important age class for population stability and persistence, especially in females. We talked about this slide a little bit, but this just shows a reproductive potential of snapping turtle versus big game species and how long it takes um, for one turtle, 17 years for a snapping turtle to be a sexual maturity, whereby a deer at that point in time would have had 912 offspring. So they're very delayed in, in um, sexual maturity and other things. This slide I think really shows it all. 34 states are closed to commercial harvest currently. 14 states have eliminated, eliminated turtle harvesting in the last 12 years. And many more states have tightened their regulations. You can see Minnesota here, we're leading the nation on this issue with other friends such as Arkansas, Alabama, places like that. Um, and we have concerns about what that's doing. The growing international demand in the turtle trade is what's driving this increase. Human consumption of snapping turtles and soft shell turtles are local food sources for some Minnesota residents. They're a national food source at Asian seafood markets in the US and an international food source for Asian markets. Um, Midwest are favored, you know, just like everything from the Midwest is great. I guess our turtles are considered delicacies as well. The pet, the pet, the pet industry, small painted turtles are very popular. Chinese medicin medicinal purposes and beauty products. Uh, collagen is an example of what people are using them for in some markets. And now US turtles, turtles are fueling the Asian market um, since there is an Asian turtle crisis. They've exploited their populations and they're looking for other areas of the state. Over the period of 2002 to 2012, 126 million turtles were exported from the United States. And in 2016, the United States added four freshwater, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, I said, I should say, added four freshwater turtles to the appendix three of species of concern, common snapping turtle, Florida soft shell turtle, smooth soft shell turtle, and spiny soft shell turtle. Back in 2001 to 2004, the department began work on this important issue, which led to the, the statutes that we have today, bringing a, a phased out. We talked about, um, and we worked and compromised in our initial stance to eliminate turtle harvest. At that point, the, the recommendation was to specifically eliminate the turtle harvest. Uh, instead, we, we agreed to a phased kind of elimination of turtle licenses. The, the proposal specified what species could be harvested commercially, established seasons and size limits, revised trap limits, checking and designing specifications, increased fee for seller's license with a sunset clause. I think that's the most important thing within our proposal at that point in time was to gradually phase these out as they couldn't be transferred to uh, on the open market, so to speak. They could only be transferred to a degree of kindred, your grandchildren, one of your relatives added monthly reporting requirements. We have, of course, had to deal with the, the all important turtle races in, in Midwestern Minnesota and other resort communities, which I think is important to remember that this is part of our heritage and we have to figure out how to deal with that issue. 
and also established guidelines for possessing turtle eggs, protections of turtle nests, and propagation. Mr. Chairman, um, the commercial harvest right now allows for three species of turtles, painted turtle, the common snapping turtle, turtle and the spiny softshell turtle. We feel at a minimum, at a very minimum, it's important to stop all, all harvesting, commercial and residential, of spiny softshell turtles. We do not know, we don't have the population demographics available to tell where this species is at, but we're gr greatly concerned that, that it's, it's in a decline and allowing continued harvest is, is really problematic. So we have a prohibition on any harvest or capture of spiny softshell turtles that is in the Senate bill, or in the House bill, and we're working with the Senate on that position. Um, and also our taking methods. You can see that language is similar on both sides. The real concern was an amendment that was added on the Senate floor that focused on um, the extension and, and the transfer of those licenses. Just our concerns with the current turtle harvest regulations, the landscape has changed dramatically since 2003, 2004, when these current harvest regulations were enacted. We feel this harvest is un unsustainable due to the life history and cumulative impacts on survivorship. Uh, the increase in market demand for turtles, especially the, the Midwest varieties are concerns of ours. And also the tightening of regulations in other states has put more pressure on Minnesota turtles. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, you have seen in our letters, we do support the House position and, and we are concerned with the addition of the language in the Senate to um, remove the, the sunset provision. May I just add one thing, Mr. Chairman, if, if you don't mind. In, in my conversations with, with former Senate Environment Chair Bob Lassard, who was the chairman during this issue, he strongly supports the prohibition and the elimination of commercial turtle harvesting in the state and actually um, was kidding me that there's finally something that he agrees with the DNR on, but he and I have that kind of relationship. But he, he does recognize back when this was discussed in the early 2000s, how important of an issue it is and also supports the House position. I can stand for just questions, to, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify, Senator, former Senator Bob Lassard supports the House position, is that correct? Protecting turtles, Mr. Chairman, yes. Representative Wazlawick. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Meyer. That was really helpful in understanding um, sort of where we've been and where we are now. Um, and I don't know if, this is something that you could maybe address too, but um, I think one of the things we think about is uh, that graphic with the, the deer and how many baby deer a deer can have in a certain amount of time versus the turtle. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the importance of turtles. So, you know, I don't know, that's sort of a broad question, but sort of why the concern about turtles and sort of where they fit in, in terms of environment and, um, and the, 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 our wildlife in Minnesota and, and why it's important to, to protect them. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, sorry, when I pulled up my screen, I couldn't find the unmute button. So I was bringing up that slide again that, that Vice Chair Wozlawick was looking for. Um, Turtles are, are a bellwether species. The importance of turtles in, in the landscape really shows the health of that ecosystem. And that's really important to us. As we know, making sure that we can see and maintain our ecosystems is, is, is vitally important just to the success, success of the species. So where turtle populations are successful, we know we have clean water, abundance of, of food sources, and those habitats are, are I don't want to say pure, but healthy enough to sustain viable populations. I think that's one of the most important things. The, the canary in the coal mine perspective and that ex example of the good, healthy environments. They're also, I think, they're, they're, they're importance to tribal nations within the state. They have a, a tribal a cultural significance to, to some tribes. And a lot of people just associate them with peaceful, you know, environments and, and serenity, I'll call it, in outdoors. So I know those aren't scientific values, but I think they're, especially nowadays, they're really important to people just to have that opportunity to kind of 
relax and, and enjoy nature as well. So I hope that helps answer your question. Representative Hosswick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that does help. I think that's a, an important, the canary in the coal mine piece is important because we want to ensure, I mean, right, the, the whole goal of having um, an environment and natural resources committee to work on these issues is to ensure that um, we have a healthy environment and clean water and, and whatnot across the state. So I appreciate the, the comments there. And I don't, I don't have anything else, Mr. Chair, unless other members have questions. Mr. Meyer, I have a couple of questions on the public resource. So the turtles are part of the the public resource. I think uh, most folks are familiar with, you know, the devastation caused by commercial hunting of bison a century and a half ago. And if we go back to the turn of the 20th century, in the 19th century, we had the migratory bird acts that were part of the, the conservation history and legacy of uh, preventing the commercial harvest of birds for their plumage. And uh, as we moved into the 30s, the the actual establishment of seasons, you know, for things because we had for for private hunting rather than commercial hunting, you know, and uh, um, and it seems like an anachronism that we have a commercial harvest of turtles, a, a, a private profit of for in 2021 that we have private profit from a public resource like this, um, and it appears that you know in 20 you know, 20 years ago, there was a deal made and that was to phase things out. But the uh, Senate position is essentially to open things back up. That if uh, the licenses were saleable uh, beyond uh, family members, then anyone could buy them. There would be, uh, so how much profit are we talking about here? What are uh, could the international market purchase a license under the Senate provision and open up, um, you know, a significant harvest again of a public resource? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, again, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, DNR. The commercial, the, the licenses have to be held by residents. We don't have any non-resident commercial harvesting licenses. However, those markets, as you mentioned, are what's driving it, the international market trade on these turtle species, because other places have depopulated. They're, I mean, they've, they've over-harvested their population, so then obviously you go someplace else. So I think that's one of the biggest drivers that are out there. Now, some of these animals or these amphibians are used for scientific purposes or educational purposes. I think we could find some other um, species to substitute for that. Um, easily so we were very concerned about that and it, it's you know the question was that representative Lazic had well what why do we want to keep them and i think if you go back to to some of our our great conservation leaders aldo leopold for example says the first rule of intelligent thinking or tinkering is to keep all of the parts right so obviously we want to keep our turtles around if we lose an important part of our ecosystem we risk entire collapse of that ecosystem. So um, we feel it's important at, at a very minimum to prohibit the harvesting of soft shell turtles, but we do, in, do support and would like to see the elimination of the commercial turtle harvest as well, so. And Commissioner Meyer, um, as the turtle harvesting equipment has become more effective, uh, is there any way to determine um, perhaps if endangered turtles are caught in the bycatch, for example, Blanding's turtle, um, is there overlapping habitats where uh, we could be losing um, unique turtles that we are, we, we just don't know of? I mean, there's, there's not a way to check that, is there? Mr. Chairman, uh, for the record, Bob Meyer again. No, we do require reporting but sometimes that reporting is lacking, right? We don't have all the information we need, um, but that is a, a, an important consideration is, is bycatch. And it, it, I'd just like to go back to the other statement I made previously is as those other markets or as the opportunity for harvesting in other states decreases, it places increased pressure on the state of Minnesota's resources. So the supply and demand um, principles are really leading um, could cause population decline severely within the, within the state. So 
Um, we have issues with reporting as well, making sure that people are, are submitting reports on time and that we're getting the data that we need. So um, all just other examples of, of why it's so important to try to do something about this now with the House position, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Any other um, questions on turtles? Uh, Representative Fisher. Sorry, it wasn't uh, questions on turtles, it was questions on another issue. Members, anything else on turtles? Okay, Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, this will be a question for the DNR, and this has to do with the change of making uh, gar a game fish instead of uh, a rough, uh, rough fish. Currently it is a rough fish, and this also is a very long-lived fish, and I know that there has been some issues around uh, the way that it's being caught, caught and uh, just cast aside, and so I'd like to hear from the uh, DNR uh, what the changes are and protections that come in as we change, change a proposed classification from rough fish to game fish. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, again, Bob Meyer, Comm Assistant Commissioner Department of Natural Resources. Thank you, Representative Fisher, for that question. Um, GAR is an interesting, it's an interesting question. We've been discussing removing GAR and bowfin actually from the commercial list for a little while now. The primary reason is that they're potential predators on young invasive carp and can tolerate low oxygen conditions where these young invasive carp live. Now, that being said, we don't have a lot of information about the population dynamics. Um, we've considered this as well as other changes to our fish classifications, and we're in the process of taking a deeper dive on what should these classifications be. Currently, they're classified as a commercial fish, which would allow them to be harvested in a bycatch um, of commercial netting for invasive or, or rough fish within the, the Minnesota and the, the Mississippi rivers. Um, the bow fishing community is also very interested in this population as well. And in a recent large tournament where we monitored uh, Mississippi River Pool 2, uh, gar were the most common fish taken. Now, this was two summers ago, though. Uh, we know very little about the gar. As you said, they're very long-lived fish. They're a very small component of the commercial fish habit, or commercial fish harvest. Um, but we are concerned about, about the over, um, pop, over harvesting during some of these, these bow fishing events. And actually, Mr. Chairman, that's what led us to a proposal within our policy provisions. Actually, it's a budget initiative that would allow us to permit and regulate, excuse me, these bow fishing tournaments so that we could provide conditions and um, species and things like that requirements on those, those tournaments. So, Mr. Chairman, um, members, let me just see here for people who um, may not be familiar with what we're talking about. Um, again, let me just see if I get this right this time. So here's a picture of, of common gar. If, if you haven't seen them, they have a long snout, I'll call it if that's a fishery biology term, <laughs> probably not. And you can see it has teeth in there as well. So it's a very unique fish. Um, one, we don't have a lot of these type of, of fish species in Minnesota, but I think it's important as we talked about keeping the pieces and, and not tinkering, uh, Alvo Leopold's statements, um, this could be a consideration to protect it as a game fish. At a minimum, we are very interested in removing it from the commercial um, fish harvesting list as well, which we can do administratively and we're looking into that right now. But we do appreciate the interest in protecting this fish population and, and wanna work with the conference committee in doing so, Mr. Chairman. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Appreciate the uh, understanding of it. it. Sounds like that. This is as you're highlighting is that these, uh, the, particularly this species, is a part of the system, and it can help uh, protect with some of the uh, issues that we have around the invasive carp, etc. And if we were to continue to lose the species, and as you mentioned, you've got bow hunters that are out there. 
uh, that can, particularly with a long-lived fish, it could cause the, the system to uh, collapse, and something that could control an invasive it would then be missing. So I think it's very important. I appreciate that further understanding. That's something I did not pick up the first time around when I heard it. So I appreciate you spending a little bit more time and, and further educating us on the subject. Commissioner Meyer, so if it became a game fish, what would be the process for the DNR on setting limits? Mr. Chairman, members, again, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner DNR, we would go through it and through our rulemaking process, establish um, conditions and limits and things like that. We have authority within statute to establish those seasons and um, take methods of take within uh, that emergency rulemaking authority. So every year we would do a rule or we do rules on some of these things and that would be one way to do it otherwise we could also come back and work with the legislature and put it in statute the the the, the previous policy provisions of doing it on an annual basis allows us more flexibility to to deal with changes in real time um no offense rather than to come back to the legislature which as we know it takes some time as we're facing right now so um the rulemaking process can be quick for our expedited emergency rules for game and fish, but also it does have a longer process as we've discussed as well. So, um, and just to put a plug in, we have concerns about some of the rulemaking processes in the bill as well that we've testified to and is in our letter on other issues, but I digress, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Commissioner Meyer, I think you were addressing that rulemaking could be more inclusive, uh, more timely, more deliberative, and more effective than the legislative process, particularly a legislative process that holds rulemaking hostage. Uh, Representative Fish, oh, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was gonna move on to a different subject if you, if you uh, wanted to continue with the, the gar fish, which I find fascinating. <laughs> Representative Fisher, were you done? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I was done. Thank you. Representative Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say that I appreciate your continuing with this conference committee. I have to say I'm I'm disappointed that our Senate counterparts departed the meeting. I think the point of conference committee is to have transparency and have the public be able to take in the negotiations and learn about some of the issues that we are um, debating. So I appreciate the conversation and I, there are many more important issues that are left to discuss. Um, boy, I wish they'd stayed so that we could work on this together. Um, you know, Assistant Commissioner Meyer was talking about collapse of ecosystems and we have some real threats in our state right now, one of which is chronic wasting disease. Um, and I, I hate to uh, burden Ms. Taylor again, but I'm hoping she might um, walk us through uh, the differences in the, the Senate and House um, positions on addressing chronic wasting disease. Ms. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, the chronic wasting disease stuff, there's one section that's in um, Article 5 on the House side, which would be on R42. This would be uh, from the DNR's policy bill, just expanding the importation ban on cervidae carcasses to all carcasses, not just those hunter harvested. And then the remaining provisions would be in Article 7 on the House side, which starts on R178. Uh, I'll just go through the sections if that's what you guys want here. Um, section one uh, would allow licensed hunters to take an escaped farm survey and then require them to be tested at the owner's expense for CWD. Section two would modify the survey fencing requirements so that they would um, prohibit physical contact between the farm survey and free roaming survey. Uh, section three would require two or more fences for farmed white-tailed deer. Section four would require white-tailed deer to have um, on their ID tags the owner's contact information. And then moving on to R180, section 
five would require conservation officers to be included in Board of Animal Health inspections when CWD has been detected. Section six would prohibit new white-tailed deer farms or registrations for those. Uh, section seven would require owners of farms where CWD has been detected to allow inspections um, and then also would prohibit them from raising farm survey for at least 10 years on the, on the premises. Section eight would transfer survey oversight to the DNR from the Board of uh, Animal Health. It would require the DNR to contract with Board of Animal Health veterinarians rather than having the staff transfer. And then section nine is just a revisor's instruction related to the transfer. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Ms. Taylor. I'm hoping that um, uh, one of the commissioners from the DNR might talk a little bit about the threat of um, chronic wasting disease to Minnesota. Is Commissioner Stroman on maybe to just address the, the threat if she's not, uh, Commissioner Meyer? Mr. Chairman, members, I know Commissioner Stroman is on. She's been having some challenges with her internet this morning for some reason. So um, I'm not sure if she can join us or not. I believe she's still having an issue. So Mr. Chairman, I think I'll, if you don't mind, I can just jump in and, and hopefully if she gets her issues resolved, she could just raise her hand and chime in if that's okay. Yeah, proceed. Um, Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and House members for your continued interest in this issue. Our, our wild deer herd is so important to just Minnesota as we're talking about turtles as an iconic species. I think the white-tailed deer is, is much more so in a lot of people's eyes and the, the importance that it, that provides to us economically as over 500,000 hunters every year participate in the, the annual tradition of, of being in the woods and deer hunting. As we've recently saw uh, with the new identification of CWD in our herd in Beltrami County, the disease has just traveled over 300 miles um, through a deer in a horse trailer or however it was brought to the farm. This new infestation changes the world as we know it in, in, in deer management and CWD, at least for the DNR, for the, for the next three years as our DNR response or CWD response plan talks about, we presented that to you, I can share with you again. Once a disease is identified in a farm, we have to survey that area, a 15 mile circle surveillance zone uh, for three years and, and keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully we do not find anything. If we do, then we move into a more persistent type of approach of monitoring surveillance and um, population um, reduction to avoid that, that nose to nose contact. So what the, the language that you have in your bill, um, the fencing piece, I think is, is extremely important to make sure that that nose to nose contact doesn't occur. Um, we've seen cases where a, you know, a deer farm we've inspected has a wild deer path beaten down the side of the fence where these deer are walking next to each other, communicating, travel, exchanging saliva. Um, some cases there is actually feed thrown through the fence so another management problem where you're attracting wild deer to be next to these captive wild deer. I mean, that's the problem in general with, with the farm servant industry. We don't have another industry in Minnesota where we're raising wild animals and calling it agriculture. Turkeys, uh, cows, things like that. Sure, they're an agricultural species, but now wild deer or farm servant are, can, are defined as an agricultural commodity which really caused us the problem. So anything we can do to reduce that nose to nose contact, I think is, is extremely important. The identification that you have in section four, making sure that um, it has a phone number or address that enables the reader to readily identify the owner of escaped deer. We've seen deer that we've captured. We don't, it might have a tag or a tag hole. We don't know where it comes from. So making sure that you can readily identify that number 0042, whatever it would be, to so-and-so farm is extremely important. The inspection, that language that you have, um, 
and allowing the DNR to be included on epidemiological investigations or source and trace outs is extremely important. Our officers are trained investigators, trained interrogators. What we see and the questions we ask sometimes are different, different than the Board of Animal Health Agents, and we learn a lot more. We've found things that have been uh, not identified in other investigations that have been crucial crucial to our investigation and close out of those investigations and the activities on those farms. So thank you for putting that language into the bill. That is one thing as well that we need to see. Um, the language that you have on mandatory surveillance and the movement, we appreciate as well. Um, the transfers of duties, we've talked about this a little bit. We are willing to accept these activities in this, this, this program but we need to make sure that the resources are provided with it. We, we do not wanna to have to spend deer hunters dollars managing, enforcing and inspecting farmed wild deer facilities. So the deer hunters shouldn't have to pay for that. And we can work with the committee on what the estimates of those costs would be. At the end of the day, we need to improve our, our enforcement and, and inspections and work with this industry to protect the wild deer herd. The DNR stands willing and ready to do that, be it through a transfer of duties to the Board of Animal Health or working with the Board of Animal Health more closely as the language provides for epidemiological inspections and things of that nature. So we want to be a part of the solution. We hope to work with you all to craft a solution that will provide more protections for the state's wild deer herd and also for the captive wild deer herd at these farms. Um, but making sure that we have that ability, authority to be where we need to be, reducing the movement wherever at all possible and, and pr protecting that, that contact are some of the things that your language does that we fully support. And just thank you for your continued interest. Um, protecting our wild deer herd as part of our iconic history, but also as a food source for our native populations and, and tribal nations is, is extremely important. So we, again, stand ready and willing to do what we can and appreciate the support that you have for these programs in your bill. Mr. Chairman, I will also note for the record that we are in the process of finalizing the, the inspections that have occurred up in the Beltrami herd. And, and we look forward to briefing yourself and Chairman Ingerbritz and others on that important situation here in the next coming days. So stay tuned for that information as well. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I see that uh, Commissioner Stroman joined us too. Um, I, so it's my understanding that CWD is 100% fatal. Um, so we have this, and, and please confirm if I'm I'm right or wrong on that. But so it seems to me that um, um, we, Commissioner Meyer, let's get let's get the confirmation, Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, Department of Natural Resources, Representative Morrison, yes, it is a neurological disease that affects the brain and the spinal, uh, it's contained within the brain and spinal matter of the animals and it, and it is fatal. It, it, it takes some time, unfortunately, you can't detect it right away by physical attributes. And the only way to test for it right now is through testing uh, brain matter from a deceased animal. So, but it is 100% um, fatal. Tom Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, another quick question. It's it's transmitted via saliva. You you referred to nose-to-nose -nose, um, contact, Assistant Commissioner. Commissioner Meyer. Chairman, again, Bob Meyer, Representative Morrison. Yes, it, it it's body fluids. So it could be saliva, it could be other secretions from, from body fluids that are there. And as, as we've talked about in committee, um, it can be persistent into the soil. The prions, what it, what it actually is, CWD is a defined, a mutated protein that then causes all sorts of other problems, as you know from being a, a, a medical professional, Representative Morris, and how those things start, right? So it's a, a mutated protein that, that becomes into the body of these animals through transfer of bodily fluids that is picked up and then mutated within the body of that animal. Representative Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and if I recall from committee hearings, there's probably concern that um, uh, remains left in the field could also be a source of transmission if other animals ate remaining entrails. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Representative Morrison, yes. In fact, that is the basic premises of 
of the adopt a dumpster program that is in in the the house position and we've supported by the house and senate last biennium to do that so we provide dumpsters for hunters to use dispose those carcasses in before they leave those areas and it's very important that people realize that you cannot leave the endemic area in the southeast or any other cwd management zone with a deer carcass intact so you either have to bring it to a processor um take down that um break it into quarters, process your own deer or something you cannot leave with a deer, what we call in the round or whole outside of those endemic areas to reduce the transportation of those um, uh, body tissues contained within the brain and the, the spinal cord. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. So um, I'm going where I'm sure a lot of people are going. Hunters um, hunt deer to eat deer. Uh, so there must be concerns about human consumption of infected meat. Um, I know I wouldn't be excited about feeding my children uh, deer that I knew had um, CWD prions in it. Where are we with all that? I know that we have this great work from Dr. Larson of the U um, developing this rapid test. Um, but this strikes me, we're talking about um, possible ultimate decimation of our white-tailed population and the implications for the people who rely on uh, that meat for food um, and, and you, you know, our, our proud heritage, hunting heritage in our state. Commissioner Stroman or Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chair, um, Sarah Stroman, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'm going to take a chance on my internet. Am I, can you understand me? <laughs> Just want to make sure before I, perfect, yes. good. Yes. Um, I'm having one of those moments where the computer responds about five minutes after you hit a button. So, um, and, and so I apologize for not um, popping on earlier and, and appreciate the discussion, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Morrison, about chronic wasting disease. This has been a, a issue of great concern to the department for a number of years now and, and continues to be one of the things that um, you know, we want to continue to be uh, proactive on. We want to continue to be aggressive on for all the reasons uh, that you have been discussing. And, um, you know, the concerns over uh, consumption of uh, deer meat or venison is, is one of the reasons for that. You know, we have a very uh, robust uh, deer hunting tradition and deer hunting community. Uh, in Minnesota, we have about half a million deer hunters. And, um, and as, as Assistant Commissioner Meyer mentioned too, um, that's a very important food source for, for our tribal communities as well. Um, you know, who, who view that harvest a little bit differently than, than some of our other deer hunters, but really important nonetheless. The CDC um, does recommend that people not consume uh, deer that are infected with chronic wasting disease. I know I have heard from deer hunters concerns over, um, you know, the potential spread to areas where, where they hunt for that reason, um, concerns over consuming it. And I think if you, you look, um, for example, at Wisconsin, where the disease has gotten sort of beyond um, what, is, what is controllable through, through management tools, uh, it's fundamentally changed um, the way deer hunting happens in Wisconsin. It has changed that relationship um, between hunters and, and deer. And so I think that's you know, really our goal here is that we still have an opportunity in Minnesota to contain this disease, to keep it um, out of parts of the state. And so uh, we feel very strongly that we need to take that opportunity um, for you know, the cultural reasons, for the human health reasons, for the benefit of our deer population, and, and of course, the economic benefits that, that deer hunting um, and deer uh, watching bring to communities all across the state. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. So I guess I'm left thinking about the reason we're here, budget negotiations and putting together an environment omnibus bill. What, what would the implications be for our ability to um, combat the spread of chronic wasting disease in our state if we don't come to an agreement about funding for these, some of these programs and projects around CWD? Commissioner Stroman. Mr. Chair, Representative Morrison, I mean, similar to 
to the other issues we've discussed, if, if there isn't a budget, right, there isn't funding allocated to those activities. So, you know, that would severely hamper our, our ability to, to address those issues. And I think, you know, the funding is, is one really important piece here, but I, I would just remind the committee, I think we've talked about this in the past, that, you know, this, this is one of those issues where uh, we need the funding, we need the tools to manage through policy, and you know we need we need that research, that important work that the University of Minnesota is doing to help uh, fill those knowledge gaps. And so all all of those pieces are really important to to Minnesota's success in in containing uh, chronic wasting disease. And so you know the bill is important for for all of those aspects. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner, um, to both uh, you and Assistant Commissioner Meyer for the, the important work that DNR is, is doing to try to contain this. It's, it's very frightening. Commissioner Meyer, I have a question about uh, Section 68 in the House bill, and that is the movement of carcasses. And if my memory serves me correct, uh, in 2020, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and, and Representative Eklund actually authored that provision. It was um, broadly agreed to about the need. Uh, could you maybe describe the difference between uh, a hunter harvested deer outside of the state and a hunter harvested deer within a pen from outside of the state and what, what that provision, which I thought was fairly commonly agreed to, uh, meant? Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner DNR, and thank you for bringing that up because I was neglected in bringing that, that section up in my previous comments. The language that we've been working on and that has been there for a while prevents a deer, if I were to go to Colorado on a self-guided or a do-it-yourself hunt for elk or white-tailed deer muleys, uh, me and a couple of my buddies go up in the mountains, we shoot an animal, we wouldn't be able to bring that, that carcass back what I call in the round, which was, you know, you would, you would clean the animal. Um, and I'm trying to be as, as sensitive as I can here with these terms, but you would clean that animal, the harvested animal. And then a lot of people will put them in a trailer or in the back of their pickup truck and drive home. Well, you cannot bring an animal, a, a servant harvested outside of the state of Minnesota into the state complete intact like that because we're concerned of, of CWD coming in. So what you would need to do would be to cart, quarter it or have a process locally, bring it back in a freezer or coolers with you. And then the, the, the head or the antlers would need to be caped out and then fully clean of all brain matter before it would be allowed back into the state of Minnesota. We have information on our website, YouTube videos on showing people how to do that, and remove the the horns and clean the skull, or you would just leave that that trophy with a local taxidermist in, in that state where you harvested that animal and have it shipped. The challenge that we ran into with that language is hunter harvested implies that you went and had a license from that state. Now, there are other harvest opportunities um, where you would go by and pay somebody money to harvest a, a, an animal primarily white-tailed deer, sometimes elk, um, sometimes exotic game animals at a, at a game, I'll call it a game farm. These are these can be pens, sometimes they're, they're 20 acres, they could be 100 acres and they could simulate an actual hunt perhaps. But what you are really doing is paying that, that landowner or that, that herd owner the opportunity to harvest one of his animals. And then if you were to bring that back into the state, legally that's not hunting, because you did not buy a license. You took that animal off of a game farm and then bring it into the state. There's still the risk as, as much as ever before of that animal containing CWD. As we know, they can still look healthy and carry the disease with them. So what we're trying to do in that language, which is vitally important, is close this loophole that applies to an average person hunting an animal and another person harvesting an animal. So the real difference is the term harvested and making sure that we're bringing those animals in without that potentially um, infected brain matter or spinal matter. So, um, Mr. Chairman, we do support that language. It's very, vitally important to get that passed as well as some of these other pieces and give us the tools that we need to continue our fight with CWD. 
I hope that answered your questions, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Members, any other questions on CWD? Um, next up, as long as you're here, uh, water export uh, protections. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you could identify the water export protections in the bill. And we're not always aligned on everything uh, you know, with the Department of Natural Resources, but you know, we can try to be persuasive. So, Ms. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think the first sections would be um, on R64. Well, actually, uh, section 84 is the first one on R64. This uh, states that surface and groundwater are public assets for purposes of water use permitting. That was part of the DNR's water export provision. Uh, the Senate has section 87, the House says section 86, expanding a prohibition on issuing water use permits from the Mount Simon Pinkley Aquifer. And then on R64, uh, section 88 and House section 87 are both the same. This is prohibiting new water use permits for bulk transporter. And then the House had also had the public meeting requirement, section 85, requiring public meetings before issuing large water use permits. Commissioner Meyer or Commissioner Stroman, if you may want to describe uh, the provisions that are, I believe, in both same provisions or similar. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, Sarah Stroman with the Department of Natural Resources. I'm going to have um, Assistant Commissioner Meyer describe the provisions. He's been working more closely on them, but just to say, um, you know, we are glad to see this in the bill. We think uh, that this is a really important provision to uh, close some potential gaps that I, I think we've all become concerned about due to some recent proposals for water transport. So I'll, I'll have Assistant Commissioner uh, Meyer go through the provisions, but um, we appreciate this being in the bill and appreciate the conversation on it today. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, um, Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources. I should just get my shirt that says that, so I don't have to say that all the time, maybe. But um, the language on its page R64, Senate Section 88, House Section 87, dealing with the bulk transport or rule um, that Janelle or Ms. Taylor went through. We appreciate that being on both sides and that, that gives us a strong arm to determine when water would be approved to be going out of state and deny when it would be able to go out of state. So we appreciate that being on both sides. The language above that on the house section uh, dealing with public meetings we understand and fully appreciate the desire of, of the legislature and of the House in this instance to, to ensure that, that the public understands and has a, a say in, in these types of issues. And you have us that we would hold a, a water or a public meeting before issuing a water use permit or plan for consumptive use of more than 216,000 gallons per day in a 30 year period. We'd like to work with you on what that ultimate level or trigger should be for that public meeting at this 216,000 gallons per day. It will pull in more permits than I think that we need to talk about with the public. Um, Dewatering permits, for example, for a construction facility or things like that. So we want to come back and talk to you about that, but we understand the desire and the need there. And we really appreciate the opportunity to, to give us tools to protect our drinking water or the bulk transfer or sale of our groundwater resources. Um, as we know, water resources are extremely important and our groundwater is, is our future, right? It's, it's, our, it's our living trust for our children's and our children's children to make sure that we have continued groundwater and water resources into the future, which also is why we have some concerns of some of the language on the Senate side that bring us closer to that Western water law mantra which states that if the water is under your property, it's your water. So we do not want to get into that point. 
Um, and, and our letter goes into more detail on those provisions and, and concerns we have with each one. But I know, Mr. Chairman, your question was about the water transfer language, and we really appreciate that. Um, you know, the language is similar also. There's some language, if you look on page R66, dealing with sustainability standards that we will need to talk about as well. Um, making sure that we understand what the, the, the level of recharge means and how that would take place, or the, the language in the Senate side, which is intended for a stream flow of 20% or less, but it gets really complicated because our work in that sustainability report did not say one size fits all. It's, it's a per site extreme. You need to do a lot of evaluation to determine what that sustainability standard would be per waterway. So. Mr. Chairman, I hope that answers your questions and thank you again to the House and the Senate for containing similar language on that transfer of, of bulk water. We appreciate that. And just to clarify, Commissioner Meyer, on the Senate language in R65, Section 89 and Section 90, the DNR would oppose, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, and that, you can look into our letter. I don't want to to de belabor those issues, but transferring permits, we transfer 99.9% .9 of our permits right now, so it's really not an issue. Um, section 90, um, determining it would make us perform a, uh, I'm talking about land values before management plan for appropriate water is prepared, the commissioner must provide estimates of the impact on land values in the affected area we don't have that kind of expertise, right? So maybe it should be the U of M extension or something like that. There's some general information that shows the value of irrigated land versus non-irrigated land. But again, going back to ensuring that we have water for generations to come is where we go on our permitting decisions, making sure that we have that available. And then also section 91 on the Senate side would, would pro prohibit the DNR from disseminating information related to timing, location. Actually, that's all we could say. We wouldn't be able to share any other information with the groundwater management area with the public, except for uh, the timing, location, agendas of the meeting, but it limits our public information related to groundwater management areas to direct factual responses to the public and media inquiries, which there's a lot of public information we need to share and people need to understand about water management and the importance of that resource and prohibiting us from providing that information to people is just in this day and age, extremely prob problematic. So thank you, and Mr. Chair. Commissioner Meyer, back on uh, section 85 on the house side on the public meeting, I think when we had a uh, conversation about this in our committee, the reference point on the budget was uh, assuming a in-person public meeting. And we discussed about, uh, you know, we're, we're Zooming a meeting right now uh, and the costs are different than if we had an in-person public meeting. Uh, has the department looked at, you know, the um, potential differences in cost from a base assumption of an in-person meeting versus uh, a hybrid or virtual meetings? Mr. Chairman, Again, Bob Meyer, DNR, thank you for bringing that up. We are looking at that. The, I think one thing that would be good to work with the legislature on, on, on that issue of public meeting is the definition of public meeting. Uh, it doesn't say it can be a virtual meeting, right? There is really no definition of public meeting, but in our traditional thinking of public meeting is what we would be doing at the legislature in a conference committee room, right? And we have statutes that require us to have public meetings, for example, on sunfish regulations. Our quality bluegill, our quality sunfish initiative that we went through this past summer says we have to have a public meeting in the county where that lake would change would take place. Literally, we had to go through and schedule meetings during COVID in parking lots that were socially distanced and limited amount of people. People could come and go. So um, that, that piece is there, Mr. Chairman, about could we do a public meeting via Zoom? But I think we need to clarify what a public meeting is to make sure that that would be legal. And that would, of course, bring the cost down. Um, in working with our staff and our, our leadership in Ecological Waters and Lands and Minerals Division, they think perhaps if we would change that 216,000 gallons per day to 100 million gallons a year, 
Um, it would alleviate some of the classes of more common permits that we would be looking at that would be pulled into this conversation. So, Mr. Chairman, we're willing and, and ready to work with you on this. I will work with staff, uh, Ms. Taylor and others on that, the language about public meeting. Perhaps that might be something we may be able to address yet this year, or for sure we'll need to come back next year and clarify what. Uh, I mean, all it is would be saying that a public meeting would include a virtual option or something like that. So, and that would change that that cost on that proposal. So, but I do want to say thank you for including funding for those public meetings in your bill as well. So it's not like it would be an unfunded mandate. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, if we could reduce that funding and provide funding for CWD, I think that there would be happiness and joy. Uh, you know, the COVID response, uh, we're in a transformative event, a pandemic that has changed the world. And if we only open our eyes and see that it's happened, and that means doing things differently. Um, we have had to do things just like businesses and families around the state doing things differently. And if our statutes need to adjust to make sure that we've got more participation, uh, I think we need to look at that. And here was an opportunity. That's, that's why we're proceeding with this meeting that we work for Minnesotans. It's not just whether or not we understand. Um, I think it's our responsibility to help Minnesotans understand the issues and the responsibilities and the challenges we face. And so uh, we appreciate that because what we just went through is an example of problem solving that could be done in the open. And uh, it's disappointing that uh, you know, our, our Senate colleagues have uh, vanished again uh, this is the third time uh, and then one meeting where uh, only Senator Ingebrigtsen showed up. So, uh, but it is part of the record. Maybe they're watching if they are. Uh, I want to say hello and wish you were here. Uh, if they're going to watch it later, uh, I think valuable information. Uh, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm hoping that we could spend a little bit of time talking about another uh, threat to our state and our ecosystems, um, and that's emerald ash borer. I, you know, I'm old enough to remember the scourge of Dutch elm disease um, and how awful that was. And we have um, a similar, if not worse, challenge with emerald ash borer. So again, I'm hoping on my burden, Ms. Taylor, first, and then and then maybe we can talk about some of the details around where we are with emerald ash borer and what needs to be done. Perhaps it's Mr. Hagemeyer if it's financial. So uh, Ms. Taylor's smiling. So Mr. Hagemeyer. Um, Mr. Chair, you're gonna have to give me a minute to find it on the tracking sheet here. Um, let me pull this up. If you have the Joint Health Senate uh, tracking sheet, if you go to, it'd be on page number two of the tracking sheet, you'll see the, the appropriations we have. Um, on line 110, there's tree planting for carbon capture, which I know isn't directly for that, but part of the uh, forestry response. And then, um, sorry, I'm not seeing it as, the second. 113, 113, <laughs> ash tree management. There you go. There you go, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> My site's not great on the yellow background this morning. Yes, line 113, you'll see ash tree management. The house provided some general fund dollars that goes out to communities. It'd be one, um, 750,000 the first year and then a million each year thereafter. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Hagemeyer, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot now, too. Um, and those are for uh, grants to local units of government, is that correct? To help um, identify and convert stands to more diverse climate adapted species and also to remove. Mr. Hagemeyer, Ms. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Morrison, yes, I think the grants could be used. They are used for either removal of trees, ash trees currently, or uh, 
and or the addition of other cli uh, climate adapted species or diverse species to replace them. Commissioner Stroman or Commissioner Meyer, any thoughts uh, from uh, to Representative Morrison's question? Mr. Chairman, um, I think Commissioner Stroman's st still in and out a little bit. And um, I'll just provide a little bit of comment and background. We, we appreciate the position in the House bill. As we know, emerald ash borer was discovered in 2009 in St. In Paul. A year later in Minneapolis and in southeastern Minnesota, EAB continues to spread and it was discovered in Greater Duluth in 2016. Our forests are home to an estimated 1 billion ash trees. Many of these trees are in nearly pure stands of black ash growing in wet areas. Once EAB has killed these trees, we're concerned that the wet forest habitat may change over to grass, cattails, and shrubs, threatening the plants and animals that rely on black ash and forest habitats. We also have over 60% of the trees in some communities of being ash. Um, and EAB will continue to strain city budgets as more and more communities are challenged with removing numbers of trees killed by EAB. So it is important for us to provide that resource um, for communities to deal with the removal and then reforestation of other species. And Mr. Chair, if I may just quickly show a map of where we're at, if you're okay with that. See. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, actually, this is a Minnesota Department of Agriculture map that you can find on their website, but it does show currently the red outlines are our quarantine outer boundaries. So all of southeastern Minnesota into to the metropolitan area and all over into St. Cloud. You can see there's some infestations over in southwestern Minnesota as well, and also Duluth. But up in this area of the state where my cursor is circling the arrowhead, the ash resources is predominantly, the tree species are predominantly ash. So we are really concerned about this infestation in Duluth and if it moves forward, what that would mean to the rest of that, the, the forest resources in those areas. Um, Mr. Chairman, it just, it's critical for us to get ahead of this game. Years ago, we prohibited the movement of firewood, which was uh, a dramatic thing for a lot of our customers coming to the parks. People would like to have, I'll call it the eternal fire going. They would bring a lot of firewood with them and just, which is fun. People like to do that, be outside and just sit by the fire, right? But that moved a lot of wood around the state. So we prohibited that movement. We've gone to certified wood, making sure you, you buy your tree, your wood local things of that nature to reduce the, the threat of the pest. So um, again, that's a little bit of background information. It's critical to stay ahead of this game and to do what we can. So we appreciate the resources and the interest that you are throwing at this problem. And, and we, I should say we work very closely with the Department of Agriculture on this issue as well. So it's important to understand that they're a part of our um, response with us. So we appreciate their work and support. So. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, commissioners. Um, thanks. I appreciate seeing that map, seeing Duluth, and then that beautiful, vast northeastern part of our state with a billion ash trees in our state. I mean, wow. Um, and the, the thought of that being decimated is a very frightening. Um, so again, I have to go back to if we don't get this done, what are the potential implications for containing the spread of emerald ash borer? In addition, I appreciate that you um, mentioned the strain on city budgets. You know, small municipalities don't have the resources to, it's a big job to get rid of this wood and then to reforest. Um, they need help from the state. Commissioner Stroman or Commissioner Meyer? Mr. Chair, Sarah Stroman with the Department of Natural Resources. Um, and thank you, Representative Morrison, for, for raising the question and, and this really important issue, I think particularly as, um, you know, we've been talking about the need to plant more trees, right? This is a, a significant, um, a potential for a significant backstep in, in the loss of trees. 
uh, and it is it is a significant expense. I mean, we're doing uh, at the state level that proactive response to to actually um, manage some of those uh, ash forests and, and plant with other species, so we don't lose the forest cover ultimately, which uh, you know again would be counter to our climate goals. And and one thing I'll point out for communities, not only is it you know a cost for the communities themselves, but this is a place where. Uh, you know, that hits low income Minnesotans disproportionately when they, you know, it is not, it is not inexpensive um, to either treat the ash or to remove the ash. And so, you know, this is a place where, where those um, areas that have a higher uh, low income population, it's, it's difficult, right, for them to, to afford the treatment or the removal. And so, Having having some assistance so that we can um, make sure one that those communities can remain forested with some kind of removal and reforestation effort, but also as Assistant Commissioner Meyer said, so that we can limit the spread um, to other places is is really important. Jim Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for highlighting that this is this is truly a statewide problem. Um, and, you know, again, referencing the fact that this is particularly devastating on lower income communities, the implications for climate change, if we lose that many trees um, and the cost. So there's this recurrent theme in this committee of prevention is always better. So I, we have to stay on top of this um, and get ahead of it. So again, um, my plea to um, our Senate counterparts at the Minnesota. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Meyer, if you could put that map up again, I just wanted to, and then Representative Fisher. Um, uh, thank you, Fisher, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and yes, uh, the, the map would be good uh, to see again. Uh, my question is, uh, when we're looking at uh, the sections up in Northeast Minnesota there, uh, it appears that's also, uh, would that also be uh, encompassing a large area of the Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness Area? Commissioner Meyer. Well, uh, I can't see my mute button when I have the map up, so I apologize. Yes, that would contain the Boundary Waters Canoe Area where, where we would have significant issues about management and being able to get in there and actually take trees down because of the wilderness area. And that would present some some real concerns to the biological diversity in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. As we saw with the blowdown previously years ago, decades ago now, um, it, it changed the way things were in there. We can't get in there with commercial harvesting equipment. We, we just let it go naturally, right? And that would be devastating to that resource. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may just touch on a couple other things related to this, the, the LIDAR proposal related in your bill, funding our initiative to use forest managed invest, investment account dollars to use LIDAR, which is radar, light, laser imaging that we've used for, for elevations. We can use that data now to inventory our forests and it, it can actually accelerate the knowledge that we have within our forestry base of telling us what our canopies are, what our forest inventory is, and helping provide us information on how to deal with EAB as well, not only with our entire forest management. So we appreciate that piece there. And as we talk about reforesting, um, the work of our Bedora Nursery and the support of that facility is greatly appreciated with Representative Lippert's climate change. It was a governor's initiative as well, but you support it and actually accelerate it with the funding in the bill to do those issues as well, to, to produce more seedlings, to get them planted on private property to increase our forest canopy. Um, it's a climate change piece, but also providing, making sure that we're growing the resources to replace the emerald ash borer in certain parts of the state as well is gonna be critically important. Mr. Stroman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I wanted to add um, just two points. One is just to give you a scale of, of the, the financial implications here. Um, in the early 1980s, uh, we've talked about when the, the Dutch elm disease hit, 
uh, the state funded removal of Dutch elm disease, and it was to the tune of $290 million to combat that. Um, and that was to, to take care of 140 million elm trees. As Assistant Commissioner Meyer said, uh, emerald ash borer could potentially affect more than a billion trees. So if you think of the scale of, of what we spent on uh, Dutch elm, that's you know quite frightening when you think about what we're looking at for emerald ash borer. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say in response to um, Representative Morrison's comment about prevention, uh, you know, when we first came and, and presented our governor's budget, one of those kind of pillars of the, the governor's budget was around proactively managing our natural resources. And so that is really one of um, our strategic priorities in the way that we are hoping um, to be able to address Minnesota's uh, natural resource management, particularly in the face of, of changing environments. We want to be ahead of the game. We want to be proactive. We want to prevent uh, issues where we can. One, because it's it's much less expensive, but two, as Assistant Commissioner was Meyer was referring to Aldo Leopold and the you know keeping all of the pieces. It's much easier uh, to manage or, or to put together the puzzle if you still have all the pieces. When you lose one, uh, it's it's much more difficult. So I, I did just want to highlight that that proactive uh, management is uh, within our strategic priorities and, and is within the framework of the governor's budget. Great. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, if you could just pop that map up one more time, and I've got a question on that. And I don't know if you have a map on CWD too, I, but I'm not going to task you with putting them both up at the same time. Um, it appears when we look at this map, uh, you know, I often hear with CWD that it's just coming over from Wisconsin. And the best way to maybe look at when we deal with invasive pests is an invasion, like you see a front that moves through the, the landscape. And so when you look at Emerald Ash Borer, it seems like we have a front that's moving through the landscape in southeastern Minnesota and the metro area and in uh, Duluth Superior area that you have movement, but it also looks like you've got parachute drops uh, elsewhere in the landscape that are not connected. And that in indicates people, that people are moving it. It's not moving, uh, I think the uh, ash borer moves very short distances uh, annually. So people are the vector. And when you see this, you see that front moving in and spread and spread out like in the metro area of coffee being spilt on the table and spreading out. Um, and if we look at the, C, the CWD map, there, there hasn't been a front. It's been um, parachute drops of infestations um, around the state. You don't see a, a front moving along. You see beachheads being established that are not connected with each other. Um, and I don't know if you have that map, but I'm going off of memory uh, there. And I think that indicates the need for the actions that we are taking. And uh, just as when we're dealing with EAB, the actions that we're taking there, because we have to arrest the pest as it's moving through. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, I, I think you're searching for the technology there. I don't know if you've got it or not. but maybe Commissioner Stroman, is that uh, kind of your understanding of the maps as well? Yes, I think I it, it would be, and I haven't actually um, put those maps side by side, but I'm, I'm picturing them as you're describing them. And I can see that uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer is, is looking for that map. So if he's not able to find it today, it's certainly something we can, we can provide uh, for the committee. We'll give him a moment. Or two. Well, he's working, I want to make sure we thank uh, all of the staff involved that uh, make these committees work. Um, it's very helpful and 
we know it's taking time. So, Commissioner Meyer, the CWD map. Mr. Chairman, members, you can find this map on our website. Um, and what this is showing here is it shows the southeast zone, our new six or a new zone that we created um, in just south in Dakota County there last year. And, and the, the deer, these are actually samples that we've come in that are positive. I believe these, these squares are positives that are there. And then it shows um, in this one, the Brainerd area. I was trying to find that new map and I will share it with you. Um, once we end here today, that shows the new Beltrami infestation, which is right up in this area. So it is very alarming to see we went from here all the way up to here, um, as I described earlier, in the matter of just a year. Um, and this discovery in the Bemidji area, Beltrami County, um, will involve the sampling and surveillance of a lot more animals. And if we define that, or if we find that disease in the wild, um, it will put uh, deer harvesting management um, and the importance of that in, in light with what we're doing in Southeastern Minnesota, Mr. Chairman, depending on the, the infestation rate and things, we're very concerned about what we're gonna find there. Um, but our surveillance will start. And as we talked about in committee, we estimate it's gonna cost us about $2.8 million this coming hunting season to, to detect or to continue our surveillance with our work. And then also that would include some population management in the Southeastern part of the state and other areas after the seasons would close if we need to do that per our response plan as well. I will get that map to you, Mr. Chairman, but this shows our situation as of last year but it's rapidly changing as, as we know. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer and uh, Commissioner Stroman. Uh, we can always learn new things and that's the value of having these open public meetings. Uh, um, again, I wanna express my regret that our Senate colleagues uh, did not stick around uh, to participate. I think there was valuable information provided um, but that's the world we're in right now. Um, I remain hopeful that we would be able to achieve compromise, but we will not, the House does not support uh, giving in on the clean car uh, regulation delay, that air quality is too important uh, for that. And putting everything contingent on that has, is a great risk. It's a great risk. So, um, when the House has the gavel, we will continue to meet whether the Senate shows up or not. We are paid by the people to be here and to participate. We take that responsibility seriously and will continue to do so. So thank you members. Uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>